Good evening, this is Pastor Dominique from Evander Revival Center. Welcome to this live broadcast where I'll be sharing the Word of God with you. Now, do you need healing? Maybe you know of somebody that needs healing. And maybe it's not just physical healing, but also mental or emotional healing. Well, the word that I have is just for you. I'm tonight in the book of Exodus chapter 15, and I'll be reading from verse 22 to verse 25. That's Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 to 25. Now listen to what the Bible says. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. Now we see in Exodus chapter 15, how the Israelites have crossed over the Red Sea and they've come to the other side of the Red Sea. They've just witnessed one of the most spectacular miracles that we will read of throughout all of the Bible. In Exodus chapter 14, the Bible says that they were trapped in the wilderness. They were stuck at the Red Sea as they were delivered out of Egypt. And when they got stuck at the Red Sea, Pharaoh saw the opportunity to chase after the Israelites and to take them back to Egypt as slaves. Pharaoh with 600 choice chariots, that's his special forces, chased after the Israelites. And as he pursued the Israelites, the Bible tells us that Moses, through the power of God, lifted up his shepherd's rod. And split the Red Sea open so that two million people, the whole nation of Israel, could cross over on dry land. They got to the other side of the Red Sea and they saw how Pharaoh and his chariots were chasing after them. And just with the drop of his arm, as the shepherd's staff went down, the Red Sea closed and Pharaoh with his whole special forces drowned in the Red Sea. The nation of Israel witnessed God do the impossible, deliver them from their oppressors. And I want to tell you, God can do the impossible in your life. Whenever you are faced with a situation and you don't have an answer and you don't know the solution, God can do the impossible. All you and I need to do is trust in God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19 verse 26, what's impossible to man is possible with God. So just because you don't see a way does not mean that God does not have a way. God knows how to split your Red Sea open. But the key is found in Exodus chapter 14 verse 14, where God told the nation of Israel, be still, I'll fight for you. Be still, I'll fight for you. Keep quiet and watch the deliverance of God. Sometimes we are so busy stressing out and so busy freaking out that we are not ready to see what God's going to do or we don't recognize God in our midst. And I've had to learn sometimes to be still and know that He is God. Psalm 46 verse 10. The Bible says now they've come to the other side of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 15. And now they begin to worship God. They begin to worship the God of Israel for he had delivered them. Exodus chapter 15 verse 1 to verse 21. We hear or read of the song of victory of Israel. They are busy praising God. And I just want to say it's a good thing when God comes through for us. It's a good thing when God answers our prayers. It's awesome when God gives us a testimony. But sometimes we must not forget to worship God after He has answered our prayers. We must not forget to say thank you to the Lord when He has delivered us. When He has restored health unto us. When He has provided for us. 
We must not be like the nine out of ten lepers that walked away from Jesus who had received healing but did not return to give praise unto God. We must be like that one grateful leper that came back to Jesus and said thank you. You see, when we worship God, we are in awe of who he is, but we are also grateful for what he has done. The Bible says in the World English Translation in Psalm 22 verse 3 that God inhabits the praises of his people. God is there where his people are praising him. God is there where his people are worshiping him. And yeah, we see in Exodus chapter 15 how the nation of Israel are taking the time to worship God, to, to just magnify Him and exalt Him because He had delivered them. He had fought against the enemies. And now they are victorious. They did not have to draw a sword. They did not have to pick up a shield. They did not have to gather an army to fight against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God with a mighty hand delivered them out of Egypt. And I just want to tell you, maybe you think you need this, or you think you need that, or you think you need him, or you think you need her. Let me tell you something. All you need is God. God knows how to deliver you. God knows how to bring you through. And we see it here in this passage of scripture. The nation of Israel didn't have to do anything. They just had to follow God. And God brought them through. And I think sometimes... We are so busy trying to do things in our own strength, in our own wisdom, that we don't always see what God is trying to show us. The more and more I walk with God, the more and more I realize that I can't be dependent upon my wisdom and my strength, but I'm going to have to lean on God if I'm going to see the deliverance and the victory of the Lord. The Bible says they were worshiping God on the shores of the Red Sea. Man, they were holding church. They were dancing. They were singing. They were hitting their tambourines. And it must have been a joyous celebration to witness the deliverance of the Lord. It's great to be a Christian when your prayers are answered. It's awesome to be a believer when, you, when you've got a testimony of what God has done in your life. It's awesome to go around and brag on the goodness of God. It's great to stand on the shore of your Red Sea, so to speak. But the Bible tells us that they turned around and what was before them was this vast wilderness with hot elements and uncomfortable circumstances. And now for the first time, as a nation that has been set free, no longer slaves, they have to now navigate through this wilderness. And the Bible says they traveled from the Red Sea and they took a three day journey into the wilderness. From the Red Sea, they got to a place after 72 hours and the place had water. For three days, they went without water. Now, doctors will tell you that the body can only survive up to three days, 72 hours without water. And that's how long the Israelites had been without water. And now they come to this place and finally they found water. But the Bible tells us when they drank the water, the water was bitter. The water was bitter and it seems like some cruel joke. They were so desperate for water. Now they get water and the water is bitter. And they called that place Mara. Mara means bitter. And I wonder if you've ever been at a place called Mara. Where you had an expectation that life was going to work out a certain way. That things were going to turn out a certain way. And it just didn't happen the way you expected. Or the way that you hoped for. Or the way that you pictured in your mind. You had an idea of how your marriage would look and it just didn't turn out that way. And now you stand in at your own personal Mara. Or maybe you, you went into ministry or you joined a church and you had an idea of what it would be like to serve the Lord and it didn't work out the way you wanted. You experienced disappointment. You experienced opposition and now you stand in at your personal Mara. You gave birth to that child and 
You had so much hope and ambitions and dreams for that child and it didn't happen the way you wanted. In fact, you ended up being disappointed by that child and now you're sitting with a Mara. Life has become bitter. I wonder if you've ever come to Mara. You see, this is where we experience disappointment because we've got an expectation for how life would turn out and it does not always turn out the way we want. Let me tell you, disappointment is inevitable. It's going to come. Whether you are a Christian or not, and we should not buy into this notion that if we come to Christ, we will not experience disappointment. We will not go through difficulty. No, in fact, we will. But this is an opportunity then to be dependent upon God and cry out to him. But the Israelites, when they got to Marah and, and they tasted that the water was bitter, the Bible says they started complaining against Moses. They started complaining against Moses. You see, when they were at the Red Sea and God delivered them and the bodies of the Egyptians in Pharaoh washed up on the shore, it was easy then to worship God. But now it's another thing to worship God and praise God at Marah. Can you worship God at your Mara? Can you worship God when you don't see the answer, when you don't experience the breakthrough? Can you worship God when life is being difficult and, and circumstances are stacked up against you and you just don't see a way out? Can you worship God when life turns bitter? And yeah, we see how the nation of Israel start complaining. Now, it's very interesting to me that they started complaining when things became difficult. You see, the wilderness was a very uncomfortable place. It was a hot place. But it was in this hot place, in this uncomfortable place, that what was on the inside started coming out. And when you and I go through our wilderness, what's on the inside will start coming out. And I want to ask you, when you go through your wilderness, what comes out? Complaining or praising? You see, you can't be a praiser and a complainer. If you're going to complain, you can't praise. If you're going to praise, you can't complain. Complaining is being uh, unhappy about your life. You're not satisfied with what you are going through. But when you praise, you know that God is in control in spite of. And you know that God will bring you through. And you know that God will be faithful. And you put your trust on God. So it's easy then to praise God. You see, when you are truly a worshiper, somebody that knows how to worship, knows how to get into the presence of God, it is difficult to complain. Yeah, the nation of Israel, they started complaining against Moses. Why? Because now they've come under pressure. And pressure will always reveal what's on the inside. Pressure brings out revelation. Revelation of who we really are. Who I am. You know, the other day, I was standing with a friend. And this friend bumped their hand. Knocked their hand. And as they knocked their hand, a swear word came out. And they said, oh, sorry, pastor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I said, no, you didn't offend me. But you see, the pain, the pressure, what was on the inside came out. What was inside of him came out. And, I, and I, I'm not going to act like a saint in this moment. There have been times where I've been under pressure and I'm not proud of what came out and I'm not proud of what I've said. So, I, so I'm just going to admit that there have been times in my past where I was under pressure and I've lost my temper or I have said things that I shouldn't say. But I intend to improve and I intend to grow and I don't want to stay there. And, and I want more and more worship and praise to come out when I'm under pressure. You see, God allows you and I to go under pressure so that what's on the inside may come out. In fact, he said to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2, listen to this. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness these 40 years. 
humbling you and testing you to prove your character. To find out whether or not you would obey his commands. I've allowed the wilderness to test what's on the inside of you. You say you are a Christian, but are you really a Christian? You see, it's easy to go to church and then to say you are a Christian. It's easy to serve in a church and to say you are a Christian. It's easy to post things online and say, I'm a believer. But when you go through trouble, when you go through disappointment, when you come to Mara and life does not turn out the way you want it, people have hurt you, people have rejected you. What's on the inside will come out. What's going to come out? What's going to come out? It reminds me of King Saul and King David. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, we see how King Saul comes under pressure. The Philistine army came against him. And when the Philistine army came against him, the Bible says he came into a place of fear. So much so that he went and he saw a witch to get advice. Yeah, Saul comes into a place of fear. Why? Because what's on the inside started coming out. And as a result, he met his demise. He died on the battlefield the next day. But King David in 1 Samuel chapter 30, when the Amalekites came and raided Ziklag and took his wives and his children and all his men's families and, and raided Ziklag and took them hostage, the Bible says under pressure, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He cried out to God. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6 to 8. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Saul manifested fear while David manifested faith. Are you like Saul or are you like David? I want to be more and more like David. That when things don't turn out my way and people turn against me. That I look to God and I cry out to God. And that I become a praiser not a complainer. And yeah, the nation of Israel complained against Moses. And the Bible says that Moses then cried out to God. Just, just look at how different Israel and Moses is. Israel complains at Marah, but Moses prays. Israel complains, Moses prays. Israel complains against Moses, Moses cries out to God. You see, Moses had this habit that whenever he got into a difficult situation, whenever the people fought with him or complained against him, that he would always turn to God. And this was the key to the success of Moses as a leader. You see, godly leadership is knowing two things. Number one, you don't know it all. And number two, you need to be dependent upon God. Number one, you don't know it all. And number two, you need to be dependent upon God. And we see how Moses is dependent upon God. He cries out to God. In fact, in Exodus chapter 14, when they were stuck at the Red Sea and it seemed like Pharaoh was going to come and take them captive. The Bible says he cried out to God. Exodus chapter 14 verse 15. And the Bible says that God asked him, what's in your hand? Use what you've got in your hand. God showed him the solution. In this passage of scripture, God shows him the solution once again. Once again, he shows him the solution. But where did it start? He prayed. He cried out to God. You know how many of us would actually find the solution that we need if we could just pray a little bit more. If we could just cry out to God a little bit more. Instead of talking about the problem, start praying about the problem. Start crying out to God. I've experienced this recently. I've gone through situations and circumstances. I just didn't see the answer. I just didn't know the way. But when I started praying, God started showing me the solution. God started revealing unto me the path I need to take. Let me tell you, there's certain breakthrough in your walk with God. You're not going to see until you cry out to God. And yeah, Moses cries out to God and God shows him the solution. Listen to what the Bible says, verse 25. So Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. The Lord showed him a tree. Think about this. Yeah, they were in this vast wilderness, this hot, barren, dry place. 
And here they are at bitter waters, experiencing disappointment, complaining. And the Bible says that when Moses cried out to God, God showed him a tree. Until he cried out to God, he did not recognize the tree in his midst. What is the tree? This is a picture of the cross. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. When Paul wanted to describe the cross, he said, Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. That was Jesus. The tree was the cross. And yeah, in this passage of scripture, God shows Moses the tree. The solution to the problem was the tree. It's the cross. You know what's the solution to every problem you face? You know what's the solution to every problem I face? It's the cross. It's Calvary. Jesus dying on the cross brought every solution to every problem that we would ever face. And God shows him the tree. He says, there's a tree. There's a tree. There is your solution. There is your breakthrough. And the Bible says that Moses cast it into the waters and the waters were made sweet. Wow. It makes me think of Psalm 34 verse 8 which says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Did you know that God makes life sweet? What happened at the cross makes life sweet. Before I came to the cross, my life was bitter. Life didn't taste so good. And then I came to the tree at Calvary, the cross. And when I experienced salvation and I experienced redemption, all of a sudden life became sweet. All of a sudden, I could hear the birds singing in the morning. All of a sudden, I noticed the beauty of God's creation. All of a sudden, I wasn't freaked out by what everybody else is freaking out about in this world. All of a sudden, I had a peace that surpassed, surpassed all understanding. I experienced the joy. A joy that was full of God's glory. I, I experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because... I came to a tree called Calvary, a cross, and it took my life, which was bitter, and it made it sweet. And what you and I need is when life gets bitter, we need to get the cross. We need to take the cross and we need to apply it to our lives. When, when marriage gets bitter, we need the cross. When our relationships get bitter, we need the cross. When church and ministry gets bitter, we need the cross. When life doesn't turn out the way we want it, we need the cross. And Jesus gave us the definition of the cross in Luke chapter 9 verse 23. He says you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You know how many times I've had to take up that cross. I've had to say to myself that Christ will increase and you Domenico, you will increase. You will do what the Lord wants. You will follow after the Lord. And when I started getting myself out of the way, and when I started crucifying my flesh, and I started bearing my cross, it was as if life all of a sudden became easy. Life all of a sudden became sweet. You know what you need? You need the cross. It's not just a one time of event where you give your heart to Jesus and there's a date or an hour where you gave your heart to Christ. It's not just one time event where you kneel at the cross and you give your life to Jesus. It's a daily event. You need to daily say, I need to get to the cross. I need the cross in my life because if I've got the cross in my life, it will make my life sweet. Where things are bitter, it will make it sweet. You know, as Christians, we need the cross in our homes. We need to say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if we will serve God, that means we go to church. That means we read the Bible. That means we take time to pray. That means we submit to godly leadership. And what begins to happen? Our lives begin to become sweet. The cross is the solution to every problem we face. You know, I was reading a Bible commentary and what they said in this Bible commentary is very interesting. They said the specific tree that was used, it could quite possibly, as that wood was thrown into that bitter water, it could have elevated the magnesium and calcium levels in that water. 
And what that would have done is it would have not just made the water sweet, but as the Israelites drank it, it became a laxative to the Israelites. It would have helped their digestive system to start working. What am I trying to say? God had delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt. But when he brought them to Mara, he needed to get Egypt out of them. So as their digestive system started working and they drank from the sweet waters of Mara that was once bitter, all of a sudden they started going to the toilet. They started relieving themselves. Why? Because they were cleansing their digestive system. You see, God needs us to drink from His well. And when we do, we start getting rid of the Egypt, the world, the, the worldly influences and, and what society and culture is saying and thinking. We start getting rid of that. The attitude of the world. The ways of the world. You see, when you start coming to Christ, don't be surprised if you get a spiritual laxative where he starts cleansing your life, where he starts detoxing your life, where he starts removing certain relationships and, and, and certain things out of your life. And, and that which you once found pleasure in, you don't find pleasure in anymore. I remember when I came to salvation, it was nothing for me to go and drink and get wasted and drunk on a Saturday night. But when I came to salvation, I did not have that joy anymore. Why? Because the spiritual laxative of the cross came into my life and it started cleansing me from the inside out. And now I wanted to do godly things. I started going to church more and more and reading my Bible more and more and praying more and more. Why? Because the tree of Calvary, the cross, came into my life. Now the Lord speaks to the nation of Israel and he says this to them. Verse 26. And the Lord said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that heals you. Yeah, God reveals himself in the scripture to the nation of Israel and to us as the God that not only delivers, as the God who heals. He is a healer. Now, there are many people right now that need healing. There are some that are watching or listening to this word that need divine healing. And you know, so many times we can get stuck in the cycle of trying to get healing through a manifestation or somebody laying hands upon us. Now, I do believe that God can do a manifestation of healing. I've seen God do it. I do believe that by the laying of hands through an anointed prophet or anointed man or woman of God that we can receive healing. I've seen it happen. But sometimes we don't always have access to a prophet. And sometimes we don't always get a manifestation. So what do we do then? What God is saying here in his word is saying, obey my word. Listen to my word and do my word. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, you will have none of the diseases that were on the Egyptians. You see, God's word is the ultimate medicine. And you might not have access to an anointed prophet or evangelist that can pray for you. You might not have access to a doctor or a physician. But you do have the word of God. And if you can get into the word and you can read the word and you study the word and you obey the word. Yeah, God says healing will begin to manifest in your life. You won't have any disease or sickness that will come upon you. I've seen this in my life. You know, when I came under attack in my health, what I started doing was getting into God's word, reading God's word, listening to God's word, listening to teachings and, and listening to sermons around healing. And we've got a whole, a whole uh, library on YouTube, on the internet, of great men and women of God that teach about healing. 
And I just started getting into it. And I got into that revelation that through the stripes of Christ I am healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5. And guess what happened? It started manifesting in my body. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 20. That God sent his word out and healed them and snatched them from the door of death. God sent his word. When God wanted to heal his people in the scriptures, he didn't send an angel. He didn't send some prophet. The Bible says he sent his word. You know what you and I need? We need a word. We need a revelation. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 22 says, If we listen to the word of God and we obey the word of God, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22, It will be health to all our flesh. One translation says, It's medicine to all our flesh. In fact, the original translation, I believe, says, It's medicine. God's word is medicine to our flesh. And yeah, God is telling the nation of Israel, you don't need a manifestation always. And you don't need always somebody to lay hands on you. Just listen to my word and you will walk in divine health. Pastor, I've got a symptom in my body. Pastor, I'm feeling sick. Listen to the word of God. And when you hear the word of God, do what God says. Naaman, you're not going to get your healing until you do what God says. The prophet said, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Until you do what the word says, you're not going to get the healing you need. You're not going to get healing from your leprosy. You know, I believe healing sometimes manifests immediately. And other times it's through a process of diligence, of obedience to God's word. Listening to God's word, going to church, doing what God says, praying, seeking the Lord, reading the Bible. Child of God, he is your healer. And no matter what has come upon you and no matter what's happening in your health, you've got medicine right before you. It's the word of God. Start reading the word of God. Read the gospels. Read Matthew. Read Mark. Read Luke. Read John. I've been reading Matthew and Mark this last month and, and I constantly read of how Jesus healed everybody and how Jesus delivered those that were demon possessed. And, and I see that he did not just heal people physically, but he healed them mentally and emotionally. And sometimes the biggest healing we need is not always physical, but it's emotional. It's mental. Child of God. Yeah, he says in his word, he gives us a revelation that if we're going to see him as our healer, we need to obey his word. And as we obey and as we submit, healing begins to manifest in our lives. Now listen to this. God then tells them, I am your healer. Obey my word. And then the Bible says in verse 27, then they came to Elam. Where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And they camped there by the waters. They went from Mara to Elam. They went from Bitter to an oasis. They went from a place of disappointment to a place of refreshing. And I've come to tell you tonight that God doesn't want you to camp at Mara. God doesn't want you to sit with disappointment and God doesn't want you to sit in a place of an offense and God doesn't want to have you sit in a place of anger and resentment. No, God wants you to get to your Elam. And at Elam, there was not just one well. The Bible says there were 12 wells. There's 12 times the blessing at Elam. And God has got an Elam for every single one of us. For every Mara in your life, there's an Elam waiting for you. You see, if the nation of Israel camped at Mara, they would have missed the Elam. How many times have we just stopped at Mara? We've just accepted life as it is. We've just accepted we will never get better. We've just accepted we will never get out of this rut or move out of mediocrity. When God has got an Elam for us. You see, Elam is a picture of Christ. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come to me you who are tired and weary and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. You know how many of us need rest. We need to get to our Elam to experience the divine rest of Christ. And the Bible says there were 70 palm trees. 70 palm trees. 12 in scripture is symbolic of government. 70 is symbolic of ministry. In other words, what God is telling us is that he wants to govern our lives and he wants to minister unto us. And yeah, he brought the nation of Israel into the middle of an oasis in the wilderness, a resort. And he blessed them. He blessed them with waters of refreshing and shade that they could find comfort in. Child of God, don't accept less than God's best. Don't settle for less than God's best. God wants you to walk in wholeness. God wants you to walk in the divine provision of God. Don't settle at Mara. Don't camp at Mara. Move on to your Elam. I leave you with that thought today. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the privilege I have to share your word. I pray that this word will not return void, that it will penetrate every heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would use the tree of Calvary to make our lives where it's bitter sweet. I pray, Lord, reveal unto each and every one of us where we need to obey your word so that we can experience divine healing, not just physically, but emotionally. And I pray right now, Lord, lead us to our ilium. Lead us to a place of refreshing so that we can testify that God is good. That God is our healer. Bless every brother and sister that is listening to this word right now. And I thank you, Lord, that you are the healer. That you are the divine physician. We give you all the honor and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to greet everybody that's online. I want to say welcome to all of you that are watching. Thank you to all of you that take the time to watch, comment, like, and share. I appreciate it out of the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to greet everybody that's online. Andre Loschberg. It's good to see you online, my brother. I trust that you and Luwini are doing well. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. God bless you. To my beautiful, amazing wife, Monique, thank you for taking the time to listen. God bless you. I love you tremendously. Sorrel Muton, I trust that you are well. I trust that Rieta is well. I trust that you had a wonderful day. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. God bless you. Yolani Buta, it's good to see you online. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. I trust that you and Michael are doing well. God bless you. Gerda Brainet, it's good to have you online. God bless you, Gerda. I see you asked why was the broadcast not earlier done. It was as a result of circumstances and being busy today. But I came online and I trust that you enjoyed the word. Henry Bridger, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Thank you for always being faithful and following up. Alex Holloway, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. I see you saying that this message is aimed at me. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit aims his word straight at you to minister to you. Kayla Barnard, it's good to have you online. God bless you, Michaela. And then, who else? Honey Barkhazen, it's good to have you online. Honey Barkhazen, welcome. I see you just came online. God bless you. Sorrel Muton, God bless you. Thank you so much. And that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you to all of you once again for taking the time to watch. You must have a blessed evening, a blessed Sunday, and may God shower you in, in His goodness in this week to come. This is Pastor Dominic. I'm signing out.